Hi, everybody. How are you doing, everybody? So nice to see you. Hello to those of you here in New York, and hello to those of you on live stream, wherever you are. I hope you've all had a good week since I saw you last. Uh, before we do anything else, please introduce yourselves to the people who are around you, to your right and to your left and in front of you and behind you. <clears throat> You guys ready? Please join with me. Let's take a deep breath. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now, it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. We see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well <clears throat> by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together, all of our relationships and experiences together to him. And we pray that his most Holy Spirit be upon us, lifting us up above and beyond the chaos, the pain, and the fears of this world to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together we all say, amen. My brother's wife died unexpectedly last week. Thank you. It was Thursday morning, and I woke up at around 6, not usually a time that I wake up. Didn't know why I was up, just opened my eyes. And about five minutes later, a text came in from my brother's best friend saying that Pat had died an hour before. Of course, I sat up in bed. I knew that I would be going to Houston, called my brother-in-law, he said, hey, Marianne, it was so early in the morning, but I was calling him to tell him that Pat had died. And immediately, the matrix of communication started. First cousins and so forth. Pat died. Uh, who's going to tell Bobby? Who's going to tell Kathy? <clears throat> who's going to tell Bruce? You tell the Williamsons, I'll tell the Kesslers, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to tell who? Uh, when will you be going in Houston? When will you be arriving? Do you know where you'll be staying? Do we have any idea when the service will be? Have you called Peter yet? And so forth. And I thought, as I went around about my business, making my own plane reservations, etc., about how powerful death is. Because these first cousins and my brother-in-law, we're not people who call each other at 6.30 in the morning. We're not people who necessarily call each other that much. We see each other at weddings. We see each other at bar mitzvahs, you know, but we don't. Uh, we don't have those kinds of relationships. And yet, when someone dies, and I was thinking about the majesty, in a way, of death. It's like dark energy, isn't it? How it magnetizes you to something. It's one of those no things that takes you into something. And the next few days, being with my family, <clears throat> showed this even more. Pat was a student of A Course in Miracles, and she was a serious student of A Course in Miracles for the last five years. And when I looked at her copy of The Course in Miracles, when I went to their house, she's one of those people that had underlining everywhere, stars everywhere. And it was very painful, of course, to see my brother so devastated. They had a, a real marriage 
and they really loved each other and they were deeply bonded and this was <clears throat> a devastating experience for my brother. But I knew, having read her copy of A Course in Miracles, seen her copy of The Course, seen what a serious student she was by all the, you could just feel it when a book has been held a lot, read a lot, underlining everywhere and so forth, I knew how she herself felt about death. So I want to talk to you tonight about what The Course in Miracles has to say about death. You know, it's also interesting, I had to leave this morning to come here and last night before I left, I had found a, a greeting card. So I've been there since Thursday and I found a beautiful greeting card that was a beautiful um, statue of an angel clearly grieving, holding a mausoleum. And I was writing a greeting card to my brother. <clears throat> I closed my eyes, I said, Pat, find me a part of the Course in Miracles to write on the card. And I just opened it up to the lesson there is no death, the Son of God is free. Which I thought that was pretty perfect. But what I'm reading to you tonight is from the Song of Prayer, from the supplement. And this was something that, of course, I, I actually I had, because I had to leave before the service today, my niece read what I had written, and I included this part. <clears throat> this is what death should be. A quiet choice made joyfully, and with a sense of peace, because the body has been kindly used to help the Son of God along the way he goes to God. We thank the body then for the service it has given us, but we are thankful too the need is done to walk the world of limits and to reach the Christ in hidden forms and clearly seen at most in lovely flashes. Now, we can behold him without blinders to the light that we have learned to look upon again. <clears throat> we call it death, but it is liberty. It does not come in forms that seem to be thrust down in pain upon unwilling flesh, but as a gentle welcome to release. If there has been true healing, this can be the form in which death comes when it is time to rest a while from labor gladly done and gladly ended. Now we go in peace to freer air and gentler climate, where it is not hard to see the gifts we gave were saved for us. For Christ is clearer now. <clears throat> his vision more sustained in us, his voice, the word of God, more certainly our own. Death is not a reward, excuse me, death is a reward and not a punishment. But such a viewpoint must be fostered by the healing that the world cannot conceive. There is no partial healing. What but shifts illusions has done nothing. What is false cannot be partly true. If you are healed, your healing is complete. Forgiveness is the only gift you give and would receive. At last, upon death, the gate of heaven opens and God's son is free to enter in the home that stands ready to welcome him and was prepared before time was and still but waits for him. Pat's family, uh, her daughters were mentioning how she had spoken often about how she was ready to leave this world of dreams. And she had underlined a lot in The Course in Miracles about this world of dreams, this world of illusion. And you know how it often is when someone dies and then you look back and you realize how much she had been saying um, you know, that makes family members go, she knew, and so forth. In The Course in Miracles, the idea that there is no death is based on the idea that what God created <clears throat> cannot be uncreated, and God created life. So The Course in Miracles tells us that the body is simply a suit of clothes. 
The Course in Miracles says that physical birth is not the beginning of our lives, but the end of, excuse me, is not the beginning of our lives, but a continuation of life. And death is not an ending of life, but a continuation of life. And there is a part in the Course very similar to what I just read that we will basically evolve to a point where, as it said in the part I did read, there's nothing sorrowful about death. Even with Pat's death, the deep sorrow is for the devastation that my brother is experiencing. But the Course in Mir and her daughters and my brother's children, and you know, I mean, obviously there's human grief involved here. But it's important that we understand, and I think it's significant because I know that Pat herself understood, that life itself is like a book that never ends. So one physical incarnation is like a chapter of the book. So if you have a relationship with someone, the Course in Miracles says relationships never end because relationships are of the mind. And that is as true of relationships where you've been divorced or you have a friend you're not talking to anymore or whatever. The Course in Miracles says that the absence of physical proximity does not mean the end of a relationship. It just means that the relationship has changed form. And that is true about death as well. So upon death, our relationship with someone isn't over. I remember someone saying to me years ago, a long time before I read The Course in Miracles, I remember noting that this man I used to know years ago, he has since died, he said, my relationship with my father has only improved since his death. So the idea that relationships go on forever, whether we've been divorced, whether we have friends that we no longer see, whether, we, uh, uh, whether they have died, this idea that life is so much bigger than the life of the body, and that is central to the Course in Miracles. And then that, of course, gives the whole metaphysical, metaphysical meaning to the New Testament concept that he who believeth in me shall not know death. What it means is that when you believe that the reality of who we are is the Christ within us, by whatever name you call it. You know, in all the great religions, in the Jewish religion, it is believed that life goes on, that we are with, with God, in Buddhism, Hinduism, in the, in the um, religions and, and philosophies that talk about reincarnation, all the great religious and spiritual traditions talk about life after death in their own way. That is in, it is so essential to a religious viewpoint because it is essential to the notion that the life of the body is not the true life. So the Course in Miracles says that who you really are cannot die because who you really are is not the body. <clears throat> it's as though when someone dies, they are still broadcasting, but if all that you are perceiving the world with is your mortal mind and your physical senses, then it's like they're on cable and your, your set doesn't pick up cable. You don't have cable. And so what we are growing into, what we are evolving into as a human consciousness is a multidimensional capacity to recognize different realms of life. My nephew, for instance, was saying, <clears throat> he said, he was sitting, we were um, with my brother sitting at a table, there were about five of us, and they had been raising my brother's grandson and he's 15, and he was in a couch on the other side of the room, and he said to me later, he said, you know, I saw Pat standing in the corner just looking at you guys. I swear I saw her. And I said, did you tell your grandfather? And he said, yes, and he, he, he said he believed me. So many times when people, and I felt it that day she died, it's interesting when death is, it's kind of like sunrise and sunset are magic hours. And you feel that when children are born and you feel that when people die. You feel this, this level of, of, of expanded awareness of what is true. And I noticed among other things, <clears throat> that when I went home and, you know, family comes in from everywhere and you're spending a lot of time together and lunch and dinner and all of that. And I noticed, for instance, that Pat, because Pat had had two children from a previous marriage when she met my brother who had four children from a previous marriage, but they've been married for almost 30 years. And I had met Pat's two daughters. In fact, I married, I officiated at the marriage of Pat and my brother. I had met Pat's daughters quite a few times, 
but I never really got to know them until this week. Because that's what happens. Something very profound happens when you're all gathered for death because death reminds us of what is real. And there's a lot in the, I don't know about a lot, but the Course in Miracles says, and I believe more than once, <clears throat> it says about various issues of ultimate truth, and it says, you can see it now, or you can wait and see it at the point of your death. I remember somebody saying to me, a kind of traditional Christian uh, type of person who said to me about someone many years ago who she had a very uh, fundamentalist Christian uh, perspective and she said, oh, did she see it before she died? Did she see it before she died? Did she see it before she died? I said, well, she saw it before, she saw it after, I don't know. You know, it's like this idea of what you have to see, and what you have to realize before you die. You see it before you die or you see it after. So the idea of an expanded sense of death, you know, Carl Jung said that the failure to deal with the topic of death robs the second half of life of its meaning. You know, until you're 25, I can only speak for other people, but until I was 25, I really sort of thought it wouldn't happen to me. Mortality didn't really, I think when you're really young, you sort of have a guilty secret and you don't want to tell other people because you don't want them to feel bad, but it's not going to happen to me. <clears throat> That's what you have when you're really young. And then as the years go by, it's a fascinating way in which as the years go by, the, the whole concept of death dawns on you. And when it first dawns on you that it's gonna to happen to you too, you go through all the requisite terror, but something happens when you reach a certain age where it is a less uncomfortable subject, particularly if you have a spiritual perspective. And the interesting thing about a comforting, it, 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 first of all, it is a fact of life I mean, that right there. And it is the only for sure fact of life. So death gives life a meaning that life would not otherwise have. And life gives death a meaning that it would not otherwise have because what it points out is the importance of living while we're here. And I think that's what age gives you. Age gives you the sense, I remember when I turned 50, it was somebody had said to me, <clears throat> 50 anymore, what other people think anymore. And that was really true. I took turning 50 really hard. I wrote my book, um, Age of Miracles, about that. I took it very hard because your youth is irrevocably over. You know, until the last few days of 49, you can still say, well, I'm still young. Once, once five, no, you can't say that anymore. And so I remember saying to somebody, I get that I'm not young anymore. I don't feel old yet, but I get that I'm not young anymore. 60, it's different. You see something on the horizon. You, you see something on the horizon. You hope it's not coming tomorrow. You hope it's not coming anytime too soon, but you see it on the horizon. But when you allow, I think the, what the Course in Miracles and any a <clears throat> serious spiritual perspective gives us is the capacity to be okay with the vicissitudes of life. And one of the vicissitudes of life is death. And one of the things I was reminded of this week, you know, it's interesting because my daughter lives in London. So her aunt had died. I called my daughter, obviously, almost immediately. But it, she's 27 years old. So at 27, you don't really tell your kids what to do about major life decisions. I mean, I'll say something like, you will go to the doctor. Do you understand me? Or whatever. But about something like whether or not she would come to Houston. It's a very long trip. She's in school. It's an expensive trip. I felt that this was a decision for her to make, for her to pray about. But I was very proud of my daughter that she came. I was very proud that she realized that, you know, too, 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 too infrequently in this, in this country, in this culture, and perhaps in this world, but certainly in cultures like ours, too infrequently do we realize that as the, the old religious line is, virtue is its own reward. There was no reason for my daughter to come except that it would be the meaningful thing to do. There was no reason for my daughter to come except that it would be the loving thing to do. And one of the things, so I was proud of her. And one of the things that I noticed as you go through life and these passages of life and the different times of life is that <clears throat> I am no longer 
the one I'm no I'm now the generation, you know, it's so interesting when you the, the how the generations grow up and like this one girl I, I walked in and 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 I saw this daughter who is my a friend of my brother's best friends, his daughter. I said, You're Linda? And she went I went, You were just born. <laughs> well, the last time I had heard about her. She had just been born. She's now married, right? I saw someone else at a funeral recently, and it was like, I haven't seen you since you were an infant. He's now a, a retired guy with kids and grandkids, right? So with every generation, there is a new phase that you take. And one of the things that was very interesting to me to see was the way my daughter and her cousins, that generation, were doing the running around. They were doing the running around for the food. They were doing the running around for the flowers. They were doing the running around and getting all the, all the, all the food ready and all of that. that. That as we go through the phases of life, you know, I, I remember years ago, there was, a, um, there was a song by Otis Redding, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, Rest in My Bones. Anybody remember that song? Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. And I remember thinking, Nobody sits and rests their bones. What a ridiculous concept. Sitting on the dock of the bay, rest in my bones. What an odd lyric. And then years later, I was with my daughter. She was a little girl. And we were at a house in Michigan. And my daughter ran in, Mommy, Mommy, come and see all the pretty, the, how pretty the backyard is. And I heard these words come out of my mouth. That's OK, honey. Mommy wants you to just sit here and rest my bones. <laughs> What did I just say? That I gotten old enough to relate to the concept that I'm just sitting here and resting my bones. You know, in the movie, if you remember, <clears throat> if you remember it, if you're old enough to remember it, or if you're young enough that you just saw the movie, uh, The Post, about Ben Bradley and Woodward and Bernstein, or the newspaper men, the, the, I think it's on HBO. Woodward and Bernstein were the young Turks who were running around, you know, they, they were doing it. But Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley were the older, wiser, more empowered people in the system who were making the very important decisions. And sometimes it seems to me that the fact that your body slows down as you get older is because it is appropriate to your function. It is appropriate to your function now is to sit and to think and to be. And my, my generation, our, our highest function in the system was to sit with my brother, to really just sit with him and be with him while he cried and just be with him. It was a younger generation's function to run around and get things and all of that. And when we are afraid, it, it always seems to me that age is like different rooms in a house. And if we are afraid of the room of the house, mainly because, and that's the only thing about it, is, is death. It, it's this idea, you know, and I, my thing about death is everybody I know has the same thing. It's not death, that, it's dying that's the problem, not death. It's like Woody Allen, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. And of course, as The Course in Miracles uh, talks about there, and I, I'd like to think that there is, there is a relationship between the fact that Pat was such a serious student and died in her sleep the way she did. Because her understanding of, of, of death, I believe, created the possibility of an easier passage. Now, when you do accept, there is that counterintuitive, like I said, when Carl Jung said that the failure to deal with the reality of life robs the second half of life of its meaning. That somehow, if we keep, and that's what we've done in our culture too much, we keep death at bay. You know, Pat was an Episcopalian. She married into a Jewish family. She was a major student of the Course in Miracles. But she sang in the choir at Episcopal Church. And one of the things that Episcopalians and Catholics and Jews have is a lot of rituals around death. And those rituals are very helpful. They are very psychologically helpful. People understand their place within the context of someone having died in preparation for death and funerals and all of that. This idea that it robs the second half of life of its meaning if we do not accept that. Like I was saying, that I was happy for my daughter that she realized that it is meaningful to come. What we do in our society, and everybody knows this, we are so 
focused on longevity, but not focused on depth. We're focused on life being longer. And of course, this is a crisis for American, for the me American medical system and for the, for the Western medical system. And I don't blame doctors and I don't blame nurses because you see the conundrum in doctors. I, I have seen it. I've seen it with my own family. I've seen it with friends. They have an ethical and medical legal responsibility to try to keep people alive longer in situations where everybody, including them, knows why are we doing this. But one of the reasons we do this in our society is because we are so focused on just keeping people alive, pe keeping people alive, and that comes from the fact that, as The Course in Miracles would say, we have an over-identification with the body. And so we are afraid, we are so terrified of death, because we feel that when our body is over, it is over for us. So the Course in Miracles says you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. A miracle in Course in Miracles is a shift in perception. The Course in Miracles says that every pain we have, all suffering comes from the fact that we are misperceiving the situation. That is, all pain comes from the fact that we are misperceiving a situation. Now, remember what, what in the section that I read about Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate is obviously a very traditional image. It's used in the Course in Miracles. But let's talk about what Heaven's Gate is. <clears> the <throat> Course in Miracles says that Heaven is neither a condition nor a place. It is an awareness of our oneness. Now, the physical body say that we're separate. The physical body says you're over there and I'm over here. And the Course in Miracles says that any perception of any situation based on separation, separation is the problem from a Course in Miracles perspective. The ego is the false belief that we are separate. So any, any perception of a situation based on the idea that I think you're life is different than my life and separate from my life will lead to pain. But there's a way of being lifted up and that's what a miracle is. Dear God, lift me up. We talk here all the time about you put a situation on the altar, your, your thinking about the situation is altered. If your thinking about a situation is altered, your experience of the situation is altered. And the altar is in your mind. So whether it's a relationship, whether it's death, whether it's work, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's career, what we do is we put the situation, what does it mean to say, I put the situation in the hands of God? Now, when we say, I put the situation in the hands of God, that doesn't mean I'm giving it up to someone or something outside myself. To say, I put the situation in the hands of God means I am willing. The Course in Miracles says a miracle is a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own. Now, stay with me on that. This is so huge. It is a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own. So what you say is, okay, this situation fills me with fear. This situation fills me with anxiety. This situation fills, fills me with depression. This situation fills me with whatever negative emotion, okay? So what does the Course in Miracles say? Pray for a miracle. It's like when I was a kid, it used to be, you could have had a V8. Well, could have had a miracle, okay? So the ego mind says, my prayer is that the circumstances will be different. That's not what you pray for in Course in Miracles. My prayer is for a miracle. Meaning, my prayer is that I see this situation differently. Because it is my perception of the situation which is causing me pain and not the situation itself. Now, we've already gone to some, you know, to some length tonight talking about how that applies to death. But look at how it applies to everything. It's how we think about it. Now, if I, if I say, dear God, I want a miracle. Let's remember this. The Course in Miracles says... And the first sentence in the Course is, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. That, that is so empowering that you can say about any situation, and so think now about any situation that fills you with fear, fills you with upset, fills you with anxiety. Dear God, I place this in your hands. Give me a miracle. 
What that means is, I had a situation not long ago, actually, and in my vision, I, I just see Jesus going like this. I just see, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. You know, this idea, give, give me your thoughts, give me your thoughts, give me your thoughts. Or oh, whatever image is in your subconscious mind. I mean, holy uh, spirit works through your mind, whatever image, but the idea of the internal teacher. So once again, it's not outside you. It is, may my thoughts be lifted above the false perception that dominates this world. Are you really with me? So that's what a miracle is. You are praying that your thoughts be corrected, that your misperception, that your wrong-minded thinking. Now, if you do not pray for that correction of your perception, it would be a violation of your free will for the Spirit of God to, to make that correction. So God's not going to force that correction on you. But the Course says that the Holy Spirit responds fully to your slightest invitation. That's why miracle-minded thinking is, I am willing to see this differently. And I hope you're all doing this as I go along. I'm your, like, I'm your spiritual aerobics instructor, you know? I'm going through these moves, and I'm trying to stay in shape by going through it with you, but I can't go through it for you. So you yourself... Taking the situation that causes you any upset, I am willing to have a miracle, but in order to have a miracle, I am praying for a miracle. The Course in Miracles says mir uh, prayer is the medium of miracles. So you pray for a miracle. I am willing to see this differently. I am willing to see this differently. And once again, how you think about something will then determine your emotions. So we think that our emotions are determined by circumstances. But as Buddha said, all suffering comes from attachment. So you're attached to things being a certain way, and then they're not a certain way, so you think that because they're not a certain way, you're upset. But Buddha, and the Course in Miracles would agree with this, says, no, your pain comes from the fact that you are attached to it being a certain way. And once you realize that how things are in the material realm is just a dream anyway, so you go to heaven's gate. Now, heaven is the awareness of our oneness. We've already talked about oneness in terms of, of, of time tonight, that there is no past, present, and future, before you die, after you die. It's all just one ocean. And then on the level of space, there is no real distance between you and me. It's all an illusion, as Einstein said, albeit a persistent one. So, give me an example, for instance. Somebody, don't, don't give me a story, please. But give me just a sentence, like what would be a situation that you can think of where I could use a miracle? Somebody blurt it out. Pardon? Lost a job. Okay, so this is the deal. <clears throat> a job is a material circumstance. Now, you, being trained by the thinking of the world, think the job is the source of your self-respect, the job is the source of your money, and because the Course in Miracles says you are heir to the laws that rule within the world that you identify with. So if you think of yourself as a body, you think of scarcity, and so you know you need the money from the job and whatever else the money brought. Therefore, within the realm of the body, it's scary to lose a job. Okay, what is the miracle? The miracle is the realization <laughs> you work for God. You have a permanent career. You cannot get fired. You being the woman that God would have you be is your permanent career. A job, as the world defines it, is just form. Form comes, form goes. If you think it is the, the source of your good, then you're going to be in fear. And what's that going to do? That's going to put you in a place where because your thinking is incorrect. Now, this is the deal. By the way, my book, The Law of Divine Compensation, is all about this. So this is the deal. The universe has, a, a, it, it's like a, as we say here all the time, it's both self-correcting and, no, self-organizing and self-correcting. So if you need a job, i.e. you need a source of income, whatever, the universe gets that. The Course in Miracles says the Holy Spirit knows your rent. So it's like a GPS. 
The moment there is diminishment in any part of the system, the universe is already ready to recalibrate. It's like a GPS. It'll just, you took a wrong turn, the universe will just recalibrate. What happens, however, is by your going into fear, by over-identifying with job as source, you are thrown out. That's what it means. You're cast out of the kingdom. You're cast into anxiety and chaos. And guess what? That keeps you from being in your power, therefore it delays the, 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 magnet, the magnetism that would otherwise bring the new perfect job immediately. So once again, you need a miracle. And the ego says, yeah, the miracle is a new job. No, no, no. The miracle is knowing that, that the, the level on which you have a job is just the level of the material illusion. The level on which you have a purpose and a function on this planet. <clears throat> and by, the, by definition, Anything that is true about you is also true about everyone else because there's only one of us here. So you might have, you might be a scientist and you might be a salesperson and you might be an artist and you might be a whatever. The form of what the Course would call your ministry, because that's part of the miracle is to see your work as your ministry. It is simply a channel and a conduit by which you minister to the children of God. We all have the same ministry. It doesn't matter what the particular form, we get all precious about that. My work, my work. Some careers like really go, it's my work, it's my work. Your work's no more. Don't make such a big deal. You've heard me say this so many times. The, big, the best advice you ever can give to yourself is to get over yourself. <laughs> and you're much better at your work if you don't hold it so precious, right? Because it makes you unable to be flexible, makes you unable to just kind of be loose within it. Does that make sense? A friend of mine was, asked me if she could interview me on her radio show the other day. And she was so nervous about it. I've talked to this woman hours. She's one of my closest girlfriends. Now, I'm not going to say her name because I don't want to out her on this, but let's say her name was Alicia. It's not Alicia. And <laughs> Alicia and I have talked hours and hours, and she's got this great personality. And we, Okay. But she gets on this radio. She was interviewing me, and she was so nervous about it, and she was reading a script, and I'm, I'm writing her on Skype. What are you doing? Who are you? You know, just talk to me. And if she just talked to me, like we talk all the time, she would have been so interesting. As it was, Marianne, it is so nice you're being, I'm, I'm Skyping her, stop, whatever you're reading, stop, right? Because she was so nervous about getting it right. Are you with me? So it's, it's about knowing this is just form. And you want to dance, you know, the Easterners really have that whole thing about Maya and just dance with it. Dance with it. Little children have that. So that's the miracle. You can't lose. If, if you think you could lose your job, you don't know what your job is. Give that woman law of divine compensation, please, because that might help you, okay? Oh, the book. <laughs> I just lost a dollar. <clears throat> Those royalties. Okay, so anybody else? But first of all, is that clear? Yes, ma'am. Pardon? Uh, I, I do, uh, uh, a microphone? You don't have a partner. Okay. Why do you think you need a partner? No, I'm serious. Why do you want a partner? To have a family. Well, that's a beautiful desire. That is, a, that is, I'm not minimizing that at all. So this is the deal. We have this illusion based on the ego's thinking. And the issue of partner in Course in Miracles is, is really the biggest gun in the ego's arsenal from the Course in Miracles perspective. Because the Course in Miracles tells us that we are one with God. We are one with God. We are whole and complete. We are whole, one with God and one with each other. Okay? So the Course in Miracles says that millions of years ago in time as we know it, although in reality it never happened at all, because anything that was not perfect love was just an hallucination we had, we began to believe that we were separate from each other. Because in that moment, which I assume was the Big Bang, because it really matches. The Course says it was one instant where it all happened. But it doesn't mention the Big Bang, so I don't know. But <clears throat> so in this one instant, materialization occurred, and we believed we were separate. 
Now in that moment, we went into mass hysteria because you who are one with God and one with all other beings, in that moment fell into a deep sleep of the perception of separation. Are you with me? And that's why we talk all the time about it's like you're a sunbeam thinking you're separate from other suns. So here I am experiencing myself as massively separate from my entire being. I'm actually one with billions of people and I'm one with the entire world. So my experience is, is massive hysteria at my loneliness. But that materialization is the belief in my separation. That's what the ego is, is the belief in separation. So if I were to say, actually I'm not separate, this is all an illusion, that would be the death of the ego. So the ego doesn't want me to believe that. So the ego sees my mass hysteria, sees my hysteria, knows it has to say something to get me out of all my pain, but instead of telling me, well, you're actually whole and complete, it says to me, oh, I'm so sorry you're in pain, but you know what? There's one person out there. And if you just had that one person, that would complete you. And that's why we were all thinking it was so great when Tom Cruise said to Renee Zellweger, you, you complete me, until it occurred to us, no, it's not nearly as romantic as it appears. Because actually, the idea that another person completes you, let me ask you, has anybody, can anybody look at any relationship that you have ever been in or that you are in now where the belief that another person completes you makes you act your best. Does it not make you needy? Does it not make you dependent? Does it not make you controlling? Does it not make you get all nervous if the person doesn't call when they say they were gonna call? Isn't it much more attractive when you're like, you're cool, when you're in desire but not in need? Are you with me? So that's why the Course in Miracles says that the ego's dictate in love is seek but do not find. So the ego is always saying, I'm seeking love, I'm seeking a partner, I'm seeking a partner. But then the ego is also the part of us that is always having us blow it when the partner is there. So for you, you desire, the part of you that desires a partner to have a family and so forth, that's cool and that's beautiful. The e and desire is a very powerful magnet. Now, this is, you're a straight woman, obviously because you were talking about family, okay. Now, this is the deal. Men are hormonally programmed to not want to give something to a woman if they feel she's demanding it and neediness comes across as controlling because it is. So to the extent to which your, your energy is need rather than desire, you're actually repelling rather than attracting. So it's just one more area where you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. You, love, intimate love is not where two emotional invalids are joined at the hip. It's where two whole people come together to play. So when you, once again, surrender this to God, you put it in God's hands, you make God, this is the issue with relationships. When God is our primary relationship, to the extent in any situation where God is the primary relationship, you will be in an aligned relationship with other people. To the extent to which we are unaligned with God, then we will be fractured in our relationship with other people. But think about that in relation to what I just said. If my desire is that the relationship turn out a certain way, that's the opposite of asking, dear God, may I just be a blessing on his life? May I just be a transformative space on this person? May I just be someone who feels approved of in my presence, loved in my presence, and accepted in my presence? So you're thinking you love this person so much, but underneath you're really coming from a what can I do to quote unquote get this person? Does that make sense? That's why 
in intimate love as much as in any other area. So you really, this was, has been good because you can see whether it's death, whether it's money, whether it's work, whether it's love, whether it's sex, whether it's anything. The idea is that when your mind, when you are asking, may I see ultimate reality here? Because if you don't see ultimate, you know, it's like sometimes people say, well, I'm not into God because I don't think we need a crutch. Yeah, right. Okay, well, this is how it works. You lean, you're going to lean on somebody. You're going to lean on something. Your soul's going to lean. So you're going to lean on God or your perception of God. I mean, whatever God of your understanding. Or you're going to lean on something or someone you would best not lean on. And that never makes us powerful. It doesn't make us powerful in intimate love. It doesn't make us powerful at work. Because we're, we're in a place of, of false need. Why is it false? Because you need nothing. You, you are perfect the way you are. And when we go into any situation knowing that, that you just are who you are. You know, I was talking to a girl the other day who's, I was calling her on the fact, and I've certainly seen it in myself, whether you think you're not good enough at something so you overcompensate, so, like, my friends used to make fun of me because I would always use the word perspicacious. Perspicacity. Marianne, do you think that person is perspicacious enough? I mean, it's such an... Why was I using that word? Well, it's this kind of over-intellectualization I would go into when nervous that I wasn't smart enough about something. So life is really a process of knowing that whoever you are, however you are, Whatever you know is perfect. Because the Course actually says, if you were any further ahead than you are, every, each one of us is a teacher and a student. So you're half a step ahead of somebody who's supposed to receive something from you. And staff, half a step behind someone that you're supposed to receive something from. And we're all both. You know, relationships aren't like, I'm ahead of you. Relationships are where one person is a little ahead in one area, and, and a little le less than the other, which is what makes relationships actually delightful. Okay. But this is the thing. The Course says, if you were any further, so you, if, if you're, you're exactly where you are. So there's somebody half a step ahead of me. No, excuse me. Somebody half a step behind me in, you know, it's really just in time. You know what they've learned. So the Course says, now if there's somebody half a step behind me who's going to learn something from me, but I'm not okay with where I am, and try to pretend I'm somewhere else, how, who is that person going to learn from? So wh wherever you are is perfect. And when you know that is when you're good at work. And when you know that is when you're good at love. It's not that you think you're a perfect person, because the Course in Miracles says all of the children of God are special, and none of the children of God are special. But the truth, the essence of who we are is perfect. So we make mistakes, but our guilt is not the truth of who we are. That's why the Course in Miracles teaches us to atone for our own mistakes and to have mercy on other people for theirs. When you begin to, to really, your inner eye, this is why we do the workbook of the Course in Miracles, your attitudinal muscles are really honed that you experience something on a human letter, level, but you know better. That, yeah, you made a mistake, but your mistake is not who you are. Atone for it. Yes, they made a mistake, but their mistake is not who they are. Forgive them for it. Yes, you lost your job, but your job is not your real work on the, on the earth. Be, be healed of that misperception, and a new one will be there in a minute. Yes, where is this lady? Yes. And, and yes, if you, it, it, the, love is, is here. But the issue is not to find love. You know, so many times, I've seen it in my life, I see it in everybody's life, you think, oh, I haven't found love, I haven't found love, I haven't found love, and then you go, you found it with this one, and you blew it. You found it with this one, and you blew it. You found it with this one, and you blew it. With jobs, with people, it's like, let's be real, right? And then, let's just manifest the perfect love. Don't manifest him if you're not ready to be cool once he gets here. Right? Sometimes the, best, sometimes the best work we do on relationships is when they're not here yet. Or when that one just left or whatever. Does that make sense? Get right with God about how fabulous you are. Get right with God how fabulous you are because otherwise when he stands in front of it, you and tells you how fabulous you are, you'll get like that and you, and you can't receive it or whatever. That makes sense? That's why a miracle is the answer for everything. 
So all the way to the point of death itself. Whether it is death, whether it is work, whether it is relationships, whether it is anything else. That's why we're here. You know, it's sometimes people will say, well, can you give me just the little thought that will fix it in this area? Or the little th thought that will fix it in that area? No. I love it. Sometimes I'll be interviewed by somebody and, somebody, and some magazine reporter will say something like, will you give me like, the, we'd like just like the five easy steps to enlightenment? <laughs> no. The long form conversation, right? Or even to whatever extent, you know, he says in the course, and we talk about this all the time, he says, my way is not difficult, but it is different. And what's nothing that I've said tonight is difficult. What's difficult is getting over our resistance to applying this stuff on a practical level. And that's why we're here. I remember when I used to hear Pat Allen. <clears throat> Um, uh, the the psych uh, psychologist in California, and she talks about relationships, and she really transformed things for me, the stuff she talks about with relationships. And I remember after going a few times, I remember I used to go religiously on Monday nights. This was back in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s, I don't remember. And after a few times, I thought, wow, I don't need to go anymore. I get it. I get it. I get what the principles are. And then I realized after a while, yeah, you get what the principles are. It's applying them. It's hard. And so I kept coming back after that, not because I didn't hear her or get it, but because then the real work begins. And I got a lot of insight, actually, in terms of my own career and why, why, we all, why people go to church, why people go to synagogue, why people go to mosque. At a certain point, you're not hearing anything you don't already know. And most of us at this point who come to a lecture like this, most of us have read the same books. We've all read the same books. We've all heard the same tapes. You're not hearing from me or from any situation like this, probably at this point, anything you haven't already heard. That we get. We all have the toolkit. But applying it is where the rough part comes in because the ego is very sly and very insidious and very insistent that this world is real and that the world of spirit is not. So I hope that whether it, the, whatever the topic is, that you are ready now in our entering into the sacred space. And as I said, you know, in the, in the Bible, it does not say this in the Course in Miracles, but in the Bible, Jesus says, death will be the last enemy. And from A Course in Miracles perspective, what that means, of course, is it will be the last thing you think of as an enemy. It is the last illusion. It seems so real. And when you pray for a miracle, the, the resurrection is the opening of the inner eye. That's what the resurrection is. It's the opening of the inner eye to the realization that the dead do not die. And I hope that you can see that that is as true of any situation of materialization. So whether we bring up relationships or whether we bring up death or whether we bring up work or whether we bring up any particular issue of material form, the issue is that material form is literally not what it appears to be. It can change, but what is true cannot die. You can lose your job, but you cannot lose your career. Your beloved is God himself, and your experience of love, a partner or other people, is according to your realization that you are already one with God. It's not that there's somebody out there that will fill this big hole. It's that there is no big hole. You are complete, and you are eternal, and you are innocent. And yes, you made mistakes, but you are innocent. In that moment when you made a mistake, the real you was not uncreated. It's one thing for me to say these things, but it's doing the workbook. It's practicing these muscles that gives us the experience. And then the Course in Miracles says, every experience we go through is a lesson. A lesson in learning it, the, the ultimate truth as it applies to this particular situation. So this week, for me, the lesson had to do with death. It had to do with 
particularly not with Pat herself, because I know where Pat's mind was, but seeing my brother so devastated, seeing her children, seeing the grief of her children. But the Course in Miracles says all minds are joined, and that the mind of the miracle worker, the miracle worker is the presence of the alternative. So my hope, of course, was that as I spoke to my brother, the words I mentioned in the Course in Miracles that I wrote will have an ameliorative effect so that in the hour of his agony and the hour of his grief that he will be able to allow more of God's comfort. Many years ago, I had a friend, and he died suddenly. He dropped dead of a heart attack in Washington, D.C. I was living in California. My secretary called me and told me that he had died. And I said to her, please go onto my computer and print out all the emails I got from him. I thought to do that, please print out all the emails I've received from him and put them in a folder for me. When I got back to California that day, that night I had a dream. And in the dream, the phone rang and I answered it. I went, hello? No, I, no, that was just normally went, hello? And it was him. And he said, hi, it's me. And I was like, huh! And I woke up and I sat up in bed and I felt absolutely that I had been called from the other side, that it wasn't just a dream that he had called me. And I woke up in fear because I could feel, oh my God, he... About several weeks later, I was sitting at my desk and I was on the phone and I was just sort of twiddling, you know, with things, files and stuff on my desk. And I saw a file that said emails from him. And I just opened it, just like very casually. And I saw his last email to me, which was that morning. And this is what it said. Wherever I am tonight, I'll try to call you. When I left Houston, and they were making all these funeral arrangements, I said to my daughter at one point, I said, you know, when the time comes, I think for my funeral, and my daughter put her hand up, and she touched my hand, she said, Mommy, I'll know what to do. And I thought, you know, I bet you will. There is a perfection. And where things are not perfect, the universe is on the way to making it perfect. That's what a life of faith is. A life of faith is knowing that in a realm beyond what our physical eyes can see, things are either perfect or they are on their way to being made perfect. They're already perfect on an eternal permanent level. And if, if and when we open ourselves, just open ourselves and make ourselves available to the miracle, then we will experience in material form the perfection that is the perfection of God. So now let's close our eyes. And each of us bring into this sacred temple that area of life where we desire a miracle, where we stand at heaven's gate and want so much for the gate to open, where we want so much the inner peace of that awareness of our oneness and of eternal life. Our mind, dear God, torments us. He said, she said, he did, she did, 
this happened, that happened, this might happen, this could happen. And we suffer on the cross of chaos and anxiety and fear. Dear God, we place whatever the situation is that causes us grief, causes us pain, causes us sorrow, we place it in the hands of the Holy Spirit. We pray for inner peace. We pray that our inner eye be opened. We pray for knowledge, visceral knowledge, dear God, of the eternal nature of life and love. We pray for the visceral knowledge of our worth and our value. We pray for the visceral knowledge of our innocence despite our mistakes. We pray for the visceral knowledge of other people's innocence despite their mistakes. We pray for the visceral knowledge that where there is a problem, you're already on it, have already programmed into the ethers divine correction. We pray, dear God. We pray for a miracle, no matter what our sadness, no matter what our fear, no matter what chaos or anxiety. For we know, dear God, that in placing the situation in your hands, we shall then be lifted in consciousness. And we will see as you see and hear as you hear and think as you think and love as you love. And thus our torment shall be turned to peace. Our fear shall be turned to love. How frightened we are shall be turned to courage. How obsessed with past and future we are shall be turned to an ability to live fully in the present. Repair our, repair our wounds. Fix our broken places. Remind us who we are one with you and alive in you forever. Eternally innocent, eternally one with you and with each other. Lift us, dear God, to this understanding, to the light of this knowledge that we shall suffer no more. And now allow yourself to feel the hand of God upon you. And as you open yourself, your mind, to receive divine correction, allow yourself to feel the alchemy. By which God himself His divine ambassador moves within your spirit and lifts you up. And you shall know peace that you do not know now. And let us not forget as the peace descends upon us our heavenly creator who brought it forth. No one and nothing could do for us what God hath done. And so it is together we all say, 
Amen. Okay. Uh, what do you want? Do you want me to do some stuff up here first or down with you guys first? Okay, that's my answer. Hi, Don. Anybody have a microphone? She's here already. Okay, honey. <clears throat> Hi, Marianne. Hi. First of all, I just wanted to thank you for that marvelous um, testimony and program for Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you for your wonderful music and what you've done for our country. Ah, uh, thank you. You know, it's January, and we start the same year over with your wonderful reading of the lessons. And I, you know... <coughs> God is in this pencil or whatever I'm tussling with that day. But all of a sudden, February 6th comes, and this lesson, 38, jumps out and what says... What is 38? There is no order of difficulty, you know, in my holiness. Mm -hmm. And it's beyond every restriction of time, mm -hmm. space, distance. There is of, nothing my holiness cannot do. There is nothing my holiness cannot do. It's beyond every restriction of mm -hmm. space, time, distance... Mm -hmm. restrictions of any kind. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I know you've spoken on it a couple years ago, but just a moment that that holiness is really power. Okay, so that's really what we were talking about tonight, because your holiness means your right mind. Your holiness is your whole mind. So your whole mind is pure love. And Course in Miracles says, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. So think about the situations we were talking about tonight. If it, it, it's exactly what I was saying earlier. Okay, Marianne, if you look at this situation and your pain is based on circumstances, and your pain is based on the circumstances and to the extent to which you think these circumstances are the ultimate reality, you are limited in your capacity to fix the circumstance. Got it? Go into your holiness. Your holiness means your whole mind. Remember, your holiness is not separate from my holiness. Our holiness is the level on which we are one. So if I go into my holiness, so when you say you're going to give a situation to God, that's the same thing. It's saying, I want to be in my holiness, but I, don't know, I can't get there by myself. That's why it's called a divine intercession. That's why the Course in Miracles says there would be no Savior if there were no need for one. Right? So the idea is I want to be in my whole mind, but I'm too wounded. I'm too, it's just too hard for me in this situation. But when I get to my whole mind, there is no change that is not possible. But do you see why? Because the universe is self-correcting. So in any situation, once again, okay, I lost my job. There is nothing my holiness cannot do. What that means is that if I go to the place where I learn what I needed to learn from having lost the job, you always want to, you know, go there. Are there any lessons for me to learn about this? Is there any, is there any mistakes for me to atone for? Is there anything for me to just to accept as a good thing that happened? Or is there somebody else for me to, to forgive? Whatever you have to do. What do I have to do to get to my holiness? What do I have to do to get to my holiness? Which is my right mind. And then the universe, which is self-correcting, the Course in Miracles says, the moment a, a mistake happens, the moment a problem occurs, God has the answer for the problem the moment the problem occurs. But if I'm not in my right mind, I can't accept the, I can't accept the healing. I can't accept the correction. So there is nothing my holiness cannot do. It's exactly what we're saying tonight. Go into your right mind. Go into your right mind. Your grasping mind wants to try to fix the situation. You're, the, the mind that wants to fix the situation is the mind that blew it to begin with. Right? Instead, go into your right mind, which is where, do you, where, have, where have you not seen yourself as only there for love? Where do you have some atoning to do? 
because you can see that you were really running a number? Or where do you have to? Uh, because remember, all thought creates form on some level. So even if you didn't get it wrong behaviorally, all minds are joined. So if your thoughts weren't pure in a situation, other people were feeling it, whether you acted it out or not. So it's all about your holiness. Your holiness, your holiness, get me to my right mind, right mind. Does that make sense? No, that's good. Yeah, thank you. You know, the Course is really, once again, these rather simple themes. So a lot of these words mean the same thing. But they're just, it's like a symphony, but it's, they all begin to kind of fit together once you can see where it's going. Okay, who's next? Yes, ma'am. So nice to see you, Marianne. It's so hard for me to get here, but of course when God gets you here and knows you're in the right place, you always show up. Thank you so much for Martin Luther King Day. It was beautiful. I was not able to be here. I've not been well. But um, I have to tell you that every time I sit here and make the effort, and I was so exhausted, the, exhausted go the exhaustion leaves. What I love is how you explain the victimization or the neediness that you have or that we all learn in relationships to why we don't attract what we want. Right. And <clears throat> what I'm going through right now and the loss of death and my condolences on your loss. Thank you. When I lost my dad three years ago, I have not been to his yard site yet or his burial this new year, which I'm intending to do, and I placed a footstone there. And he was very spiritual, and he would have loved, I'm accumulating these readings for him. What I love that you said was that you can make a mistake, and at that moment, you're not in your right mind, and that's right. where I was this morning. I'm starting to text people before I wake up. I'm not prayed. I have not meditated. I haven't even eaten anything. And that is not the time to act out with someone when you're not thinking clearly. And how when you connect with God through your spirit, you can really get back to normality at any moment. So listening to you and hearing you discuss that makes me realize it's time for me to formally find the book, start the course. So today I read chapter one. And I, it was a resistance because I didn't want to find it. I didn't have a bookshelf. I couldn't find it in the box. It's basically baloney that I just didn't want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm reading it and I'm looking at it and I say, oh, this is unpleasant because it's the awareness. But the teachings that I've listened to for so many years get you prepared to want to be healthy. And I'm another spiritual past. You're not my only one. But it's time for me to be on this one because I'm going through, when your health is at risk and everything changes and you turn 50, I love what you said, you're not old yet, but you're now older. Mm -hmm. And I'm 52 and I hate it. Have, <laughs> you, uh, have you read my book, Age of Miracles? I do, I have it now. Yeah. I read it in California. I then lost it along with the other book and I found it again. I didn't lose it. I didn't want to see it. Mm -hmm. Of course I didn't lose. I mean, I did move and I couldn't find it. I finally said, I'm going through the books. Mm -hmm. I sat at my mother's apartment and I looked at it and I found right. not everything, uh -huh. but what I needed. Now there's a stack with a okay. bookshelf. So okay. very good. So, so I want to know, thank you. I don't know, given what's happening in the country today, I don't know how people are making it without, without a spiritual path. And now we the know the answer to that. And that's how many people are on meds. I mean, it's a very, you know, it's a very chaotic moment that if you don't build a space of inner peace and do the work that it takes to have that, this is a rough, a rough time. And once again, that's the medicalization. That's not a disease. It's a disease of human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so who's thank next? you for the teachings. Pardon, thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Oh, I've welcome. Oh, uh, thank you. On live streams for uh, the last thank two you. Plus years. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I need a miracle or my family needs a miracle. Okay. My brother's turned 65 today, and he's been missing since October 2nd. He lived on the side of a mountain in a trailer, no electricity, no running water, no phone, in a sort of druggy community. 
so he's presumed dead. His ID is still there. His food assistance stamps are still there. He got his first Social Security, <laughs> you know, payment, and everything's sitting in the account. It's not disappearing. And my family, you know, we need resolution in a way, but we don't know has he, you know, it's, it's a steep mountain. Has he fallen oh. into a crevasse because the land's oh, slipping? So Two other men have disappeared. One was found floating in the river, decapitated. So there's bad stuff happening too. It's just this no man's oh, land. I'm so sorry. So, you know, I mean, I, I sit here and go, well, this is not the reality. And what am I, what perception needs to change? But this is well, this is a, a circumstance prayer. that is real, prayer, and yeah, yeah, that maybe we can have of some. Uh, definitely, a miracle could bring right. his presence of course. in whatever state it of is. Of course, and um, prayer is the medium yes. of miracles. <laughs> I pray every what day. Is you, for, what is your name? My name's Joanne, and, and he's Michael. Michael. Yeah. So sorry. Let's Thank let's you. pray right now. <clears throat> let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we join with Joanne in prayers for her and for her family and for her brother. We place this situation, dear God, in your hands. And we pray that the universe might be arranged in whatever way in order that peace and resolution might come for Joanne and for her family. Wherever Michael is, in whatever state of eternal life he is in, whether embodied or not, may he be surrounded by angels, may he be ministered to and comforted, and may the eternal bond between him and his family be made ever more secure. Give peace, dear God, to those who love him. Bring forth the miracle that is needed here, the miracle of eternal life. And so it is, together, we all say, amen. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, over there. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So, um, thankfully, I, I really try to live my life through a spiritual lens and make decisions all through this kind of spiritual intuition. And my, my, the work I do, I don't separate from that spiritual mission of life. Um, and I'm a filmmaker, and um, I am kind of working on a story that's very sensitive about people who are on the front lines of a terrorist attack. And some of them are attackers, some of them are victims. And at this moment, you know, I've been carrying this story for two years, and it's a beautiful, deep story. And I, you know, I, I was at a kind of a, a, a crossroads where I was going to, you know, get money from Amazon, a lot of money, and do like a four-part series. And I walked away from that deal. The guy, actually, the executive producer of it was, I mean, the head of the division, it was the executive producer of The Apprentice. So, you know, you can kind of imagine, like, it's reality TV, it's a very different aesthetic. And I walked away from that kind of firm belief that this, what I'm doing, is sacred and it needs to be done in the right way. And, and now I'm at this kind of difficult position where I know everything is through God's hand. And I know that my intentionality behind this project hopefully is in the direction of doing something that is beautiful and, and pleasing to that divine. Um, but I think I just need some clearing and, and help to have faith and trust and do what happened they they stopped they they gave a red light they decided they didn't want to do it there was a there was a yeah there was a kind of a an a, a difference of opinion so to speak mm -hmm. you know it's interesting sometimes we use this spiritual stuff against ourselves and I notice that a lot of times people who are into the spiritual, it's really interesting the ambivalence and the conflicted relationship that some spiritual seekers have with big business. 
On one hand, you want to play with the big boys. You want to get a four-part deal with Amazon. And he's the producer of The Apprentice, so he's got a big time, right? You want to do that. But if you're going to do that, then get with the program. And the program is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Next. So what you're doing is your mind is actually using the spiritual against you here. Does that make sense? Yes. So the fact that it didn't work is just because we're talking Amazon here. We're talking about a lot of money. We're talking about some they do, sometimes they decide not to. That's the way it goes. I walked away from the deal. It wasn't well, that they... It, okay, so they yeah. wanted something that no, you I didn't... I didn't want to compromise on. Well, yeah. I, I, I can understand. If, they, if this is the producer of The Apprentice, he probably wanted to go somewhere with it yes. that you didn't in your spiritual purity want to go. Yes. Hello, you're learning about capitalism. Yeah. It's a, it's a grown-up thing. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So let's not be so precious. You're playing with the big boys, right? And that's really the way it is. And that's a learning, too. I, I'm fine with that. I, mean, I walked away, but I just need now some sort of self-belief and, and, and kind of protection well, from God well, actually, to do if, it. Well, it, I would submit to you that what you need is what I just said, among other things. Because you're, when you say a self-belief... My point to you is you're making it an issue of self-belief. That's my, my point to you. It is not an issue of self-belief. It's an issue of how business operates and if people, uh, so what you've got, and, and it's nobody's fault, by the way. It's kind of the situation we have. Some people are saying, we don't want to put that much money into it. You want to make it so pure. We're not sure that would sell. We need to have it more sensational in order to sell. She doesn't want to do that. This is not about your belief in yourself. This is about your learning that if, you, if, if you're going to be in, in the fields of real business getting done, films being made, which is great that you are, your personalizing it is working against you. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So it's really not about clearing your personal stuff. It's about knowing that it's now personal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this, but what does the spiritual realm fit into any of this? Pardon? What is the spiritual? Yeah, how does the spiritual realm fit into this? The spiritual realm fits in that you always get, you know, it's like, it's like St. Mick once said. Uh, you'll get what you, what you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need, right? So the issue is it didn't happen. For you to put too much spiritual on this one, your lesson is patience. So your ego is saying, if you had it all together, it would have happened. What The Course in Miracles is saying is that it is perfect as it is, you're learning lesson, and you're learning a more sophisticated view about business, and so forth. It's perfect. They aren't the ones. The producer of The Apprentice is not the right producer for the, the thing that you mentioned, and you were all excited about it just because it was Amazon. You're, this is a big lesson in maturity for you, yeah. right? He's not, maybe you can step back and go, how could the producer of The Apprentice? They've made gazillions off that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so this is learning. And, and, the, and, and it's learning about savvy. And learning, but this is, this is all perfect. Does that make sense? So it wasn't so for you to say, oh, there was something wrong. No, there's nothing wrong. It's all right, actually. It's all perfect. And there is a perfect producer for that. But you, you, when, you, when you look at it from a higher perspective, you always laugh at yourself how you might have thought that the producer of The Apprentice would want to do that. Am I wrong? No, you're Hello. <laughs> and this is about growing up, isn't it? It's about growing up and learning about business and learning about like, hello. Now that doesn't mean, you know, that sounds more like a Netflix. You know, I mean, you know how this works. You know, you, you're a vice or something. I mean, you're, you're talking about something far more, me, you know, deeper and meaningful about what really is than would fit with the producer of The Apprentice. By the way, that's not making the producer of The Apprentice wrong. But that's more of a money-making type thing where they're going to go for the sensational. So isn't this perfect that you got to learn all that? Now you want to feel what? I, I don't want to feel blocked. I just want to be able to kind of finish, you know, my, my project with the, with the right spirit and, and kind of move forward. Well, you're going to have to learn some patience. You're like every other filmmaker out there. Do you know you're about one of probably um, five million filmmakers who have great projects and want to have it, have it happen tomorrow. Some of them might be in this room. Yeah. You know, all of this is going to make you and is making you, if you allow yourself, a far more sort of sophisticated woman about these things. And that will only help you. 
and will make people feel more confident working with you too. Because there's sometimes the spiritual types, we're like the ones who sit in the room like we don't quite get it, it doesn't serve you. So learning about business will make you better at business. And you'll, then when you know how the, what the rules are and you go in with the purity of your uh, project and intent, they'll respect you for that and you'll find the right people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So really the lesson is you tarried in a silly place. But it's, un it's understandable that you did because it would be very enticing. But you, but you will now be a woman who would know, well, that's not going to work. But you had to go through that. This is really important. But there's somebody who'll be perfect for that, and you'll, you'll make more of a beeline for it. So there's nothing to unblock. There's just something to see. We heal one aha at a time. The only thing that's blocked is our vision. And you see now, silly me, that I thought the producer of the apprentice was going to do this one. Right? Am I wrong? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Yes, ma'am. I lived in Hollywood for a long time. <clears throat> <laughs> Hi, Marianne. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. See you in person. Um, I <clears throat> have been kind of dealing with depression, and my depression comes when I start thinking, like the inner voices say, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not this, you're not that, and I believe them. And I've gotten to a point now where I've, the voice that counters that has gotten a lot louder, but sometimes it just it's not loud enough. Um, so I was hoping, can you perhaps suggest some things that I can say to myself or do to make that voice louder. Yeah, A Course in Miracles. Um, but let's talk about this. There's a big scam, a big scam in our society today. Big Pharma is making billions of dollars on it. I suffer from depression. No, 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 no. The Course in Miracles makes it very clear. If your mind is not aligned with the truth of who you are, you will be depressed. What could be more depressing than to forget who you are? What could be more depressing than to forget who you are? You don't suffer from depression any more than anybody else does. Oh, how dare I say that? But that's what the Course in Miracles says. The medicalization of despair is just one more way that huge corporate interests have made a profit center off human suffering. So, when this I suffer from depression part, be real careful with that. Because we all suffer from depression when we forget who we are. All of us. Without, and so what the Course in Miracles tells us is that there is a dominant thought system that, that prevails within this planet that is based on fear instead of love. It is depressing. So the entire human race is depressed in that sense. Does that make sense? To the extent to which we are at the effect of that thought system. So a sp the answer is a serious spiritual path. A Course in Miracles does not claim a monopoly on truth. It's one statement of universal spiritual themes. But the... the um, Latin root of the word religion is religio, to bind back to the truth of who you are. Now, the Course in Miracles is not a religion, but it is a psychological training in the relinquishment of a thought system based on fear, which is depressing, and whose basic core belief is that you're not good enough. Because its basic core belief is that you are a body, so even if, you know, no matter how gorgeous you are, there's going to be somebody out there as gorgeous, no matter what, how good your resume is, there's going to be somebody out there whose resume is as good, no matter how much you might have gotten it right today, you could get it right tomorrow, no matter how much they love you today, they could love you tomorrow, so there's no permanent peace within that entire realm of self-perception. So when, you know, I was saying earlier that when people say, uh, you know, can you just give me the thought? No, it is an entire reversal of one way of seeing who you are, 
But I really hope that you will think about what I said, this, this, this idea that I suffer from depression, and when I, I ha am in my depressive period, that voice says this to me. No, 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 no. That voice is the voice in all of us. It is the voice of the ego. The ego speaks first and the ego speaks loudest. What you just said that that voice says to you, it says to all of us, I assure you. And yet, the, in both Judaism and in Christianity, there is a phrase that is used in the Course in Miracles, the small, still voice for God. So in the Course in Miracles, through meditation in the morning, through these lessons, we learn to listen to the small, still voice within. And then the crazy voice telling you how awful you are throughout the day will not have as much power. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Have you seen my book, A Return to Love? I have. And have I've, you read it? I read it a long time ago, but... I probably should reread it. Well, I don't know if there's a should there, but just know that the return to love is, it's like the cliff notes of A Course in Miracles. So if those ideas or anything you heard me talk about tonight seem of interest to you, then know that you do have an attraction to The Course in Miracles. Now, I always say to people, why don't you do it for 30 days? If at the end of 30 days doing the workbook, it, it, you just feel like it's not for you, that's fine. It will not have been a waste of your time. Do you know what I mean? It won't have been a waste of your time to do those 30 days. And I think it will speed you along to the path that is for you. If you or anyone else in the room goes, I just don't think the course is it, just say a little prayer in your heart and some book will fall at your feet within days. There are m many, many different paths, but they all have, there's one truth with a capital T. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I, can I do one more yes. thing? I'm in like a transitionary period where I'm moving from one um, thing to the next as far as work is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I got this revelry, this aha, as I was on my way here that I'm not getting to this place quick enough. And I said to my, and I think the still small <laughs> voice said to me, all right, well, there's things that I need to do with you first. I need to heal the broken places. I need to make you whole so that when you get there, you'll know what to do with the gift that I'm giving you. Sounds like God to me. Yeah. And I was hoping we could just, I heard you pray for the lady. Can you pray sure. for me too? Of course. Okay. What is your name? It's Natalie. Natalie. Yeah. Okay. So this is, and actually what we'll do on this one, let me see how we're doing. Uh, would you put Natalie on the prayer list? And we'll make that a whole prayer for everybody about that. Okay. All right. Who's next? Somebody way over there. I see Sarah, Michael, anybody else over in this section before I leave this section? Yes, ma'am. Hi, this is my first time here. I was just, I've seen you on TV and read your books and I was walking and by. I'm shorter than you thought I was. <laughs> I was walking by on my way home and there you were. And it was so beautiful. So it must have been a miracle. Um, and anyways, my question, I guess, is I'm trying to really listen and pray and meditate and hear my truth. Right. Sometimes I have a hard time deciphering um, my fear versus my intuition, because sometimes maybe your intuition tells you something that might be scary. Yeah. And then I'm not sure whether that's just a blemish of my mind or right. the truth. Right. Um, Recently, I let a person back into my life that had hurt me in the past right. um, <laughs> on faith and on hope, and things have been going well, but when I get still, I sometimes feel like he doesn't love you and it's the wrong person, and it's not out of what's actually happening between us. It's just like a voice, and I don't know if that's my wound or the truth. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Because you're in a room full of people who have prayed together. Yeah. And <clears throat> when you've been in a room like we're all in and we've prayed together and so forth, it's difficult to lie to yourself. Yeah. Which is it? I always, I always hear no. I always you hear, hear no No, one. that he doesn't love you. I always, that's what I always hear. But that's also my deepest fear, that I'm unlovable, right? So that's why it's hard. I'd go with the voice for God rather than the fake psychotherapist inside your head. Okay. 
It's everybody's deep fear, deepest yeah. fear. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. Because that's what the ego tells all of us, that yeah. we are unlovable. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit is the voice of your gut. Yeah. And usually, if you have a sense something's wrong, something's wrong. Okay. That's what my experience is. Is anybody... Is that not true? How many times have you looked back and gone, I knew it, I knew something was off, I knew something was off. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, nobody else on this side. Okay, okay, I'm coming over there. Charles. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for tonight. It was beautiful. Um, Thank you. What the young lady just asked actually just brought something up within me, and I, I would like to ask for your guidance <laughs> about something. Um, over the past, oh, 10 years or so, um, I've had the opportunity to either mentor or sponsor a bunch of men and women um, that, due to circumstances in their own lives, have no baseline of what it is like to live unmedicated. And it's, it's a challenge for me sometimes to know how to, how to guide them when I've, I don't have that experience. And in fact, one good friend of mine I was on the phone with a couple of days ago just was saying to me that they were telling their parents this last Thursday that they wished that they went to sleep and didn't wake up again. And, you know, she was, she had shared with me that this tends to happen when she's having her monthly cycle and she gets very, very, you know, very hormonal and uh, very emotional and very depressed. And it's a challenge because, I mean, I know how to, I'm, I'm really good <laughs> at guiding and, and in a lot of ways, but when it comes to certain people that, you know, just speaking to big pharma and with a lot of the people that I know that have dealt with different mental illness or they've been, people become so latched on to their diagnoses that then they, they feel that that's who they are and they don't open themselves up to things like the course or other options. And it's, it's just a little, I'm confused about how to, how to guide them. Well, we have an epidemic of that in our society today. On one hand, if you're talking about things like bipolar, schizophrenia, that's a whole different conversation, way beyond my expertise on anything like that. Those are mental illnesses where I can certainly understand, uh, you know, the conversation around psychotherapeutic drugs is certainly legitimate. It's, I don't claim any expertise or anything. However, there is a normal, a, a spectrum of normal human despair that is not a mental illness. Losing a loved one is painful, but it's not a mental illness. Having your period, I mean, I remember 36 hours before my menstrual cycle, I was inconsolable for 24 hours. Women have been going through these things for hundreds of thousands of years at least. It's like these people I hear put their young, young daughters on birth control pills to quote unquote regulate their hormones. Give me a break. Nature has been regulating women's hormones for hundreds of thousands of years having been going through a divorce, losing a job, going through a bankruptcy, these things are painful, but they are not a mental illness. And what's happening is that we are losing our capacity to, to navigate uh, sadness. Um, and it's a muscle that withers away, you know, and this is what my book, Tears to Triumph, is about. The psyche has an immune system, just like the body does. And the psyche, can, just like the body, can take and absorb um, a large amount of assault and injury and sickness and heal from that, so can the psyche. Look at my, my brother, what he's going through. And, you know, I, w I was saying to him, and I was saying to his daughter, I think, it's just like when your physical body is, is you know, punched or bruise, or car accident, you just have to be very gentle with it for a while. There's nothing you can do, you know, once you've done the outer things, you just lie there. 
and just be, have to be gentle while your body heals. And we have lost our, our realization that the mind will heal itself. This is what it means to bear witness to someone's agony. You know, like my being in Houston or the rest of the family being in Houston. It's not like, quote unquote, we could do anything for my brother, but just being there. We've lost our sense of that to just be with each other during sad times. These are the dark nights of the soul. That's what that book, Tears to Triumph, is about. So as far as your role within that, remember, and I know you know you're a serious student of the Course, the Course in Miracles says you will be told what to say, but don't underestimate the power of just being with someone in the hour of their agony. Right. You know, they found that, you know, they spent $25 million on this study and what they, about what makes kids learn. And they found that what makes kids learn more than anything else is if one adult, and it doesn't have to be a member of the biological family, cares that they do and spends one hour a week with them. We, we have lost our sense of just what it means that we're gonna listen to each other and be together and kind of like what's going on with you and what's going on with you. We've all got, we're all looking at the screens or we're looking at the whatever, just, it's just like being with each other. So if you are just being with that person, mm -hmm. spirit will tell you, Charles, exactly what to say. If there's anything to say, sometimes there's nothing even to say except I understand. Mm -hmm. You know, I was telling my daughter the other day, because I, <clears throat> you know, I'm in an age, so it's, you know, people m more, you know, I was doing a funeral of a uh, couple weeks ago, a good friend whose husband died. So my daughter, I said, would you come downstairs? I want you to see her. And my daughter forgot for a moment that her husband had died. I said, don't you remember? Or something. I, no, and she went, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. And then I told her when we left, I said, honey, this isn't like you did anything wrong, but I just want to say proactively, when you're with someone like that, take a moment. I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. I heard about your loss. I'm very, very sorry. Just taking that moment. Sometimes these days people will say, well, I didn't want to mention it. What do you mean you want to mention? What, they're not thinking about it? When just the comfort of, of a tender, like, moment, yeah. that's all, just I guess to be. I, I appreciate that great, very much. I guess it's, it's in those moments where I am sitting there listening yeah. and conversing. It's the quality of your and listening. And I am being told. The quality of your compassion. But they don't want to hear it. <laughs> and that happens, actually, that happens a lot. Well, I don't know. What, what kind of thing do you say that they don't want to hear? The that, that the answer is not necessarily found in a pill, and that oh, well, so well, some of the things that, that one, well, I, I don't say it like that. Yeah. I don't say it like that. But but a, certain things, in, just like what, along the lines of what you just shared. Yeah. Well, the course in miracle. But but remember, the social agreement in this room is such that I have permission to say what I really think. That's that's that makes it different. I mean, the social agreement in this room is, tell me what you really think. But there are all kinds of situations in my life where that might not be my, the social permission, right? So the Course in Miracles is very clear about that. In every situation, you go from silence and ask for the word uh, from the Holy Spirit because, uh, it, it, in fact, it says, if you go too far for someone and they're listening, you, it will promote what the Course in Miracles calls learning failure. So sometimes the quality of you're just smiling at someone is as far as the Holy Spirit would have you go or saying, I understand. You don't always have social permission. And if you don't have the social permission to go to a certain place, it, they, they will shut down rather than hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who, uh, Sarah over there. And was there somebody else over here? And then I, what, do you know what I did with that clipboard? Because there were. Does anybody see it where I, thank you. Uh, okay, let me do Sarah, and then I want to do a couple on those clipboard uh, before we go. Oh, we're, we're doing fine, Tom Wise. Sarah? Yeah. yeah, I'm right here. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, so, um, I have been athletic all my life. My dad, when I was growing up, he, he and his cronies built a skating rink, and I started skating, and then I really started skating, and I competed, and, um, and I, you know, 
done well, and then my brother was taking karate, and I switched to karate, and I got a black belt in karate when I was 15, and then I went to prep school, and it was a big jock school, and I, I was running a lot, and then I moved to New York and started doing spinning and running, and so I've always just loved um, being athletic and always have had it as sort of part of my identity and pride, and pride in a good way, I think. And um, and so on this last January, I, something, something happened in me, in my body, and I, I had trouble, um, like, moving, like, making fists and getting out of bed properly because I didn't have any, like, musculature in my, my arms, and, um, I was unable to sleep and, um, and started walking funny. My left foot, my left ankle just wouldn't, just hit the ground funny. And finally, I was diagnosed. Um, I went through all sorts of testing with neurologists and uh, a rheumatologist and my internist. And I was diagnosed with Lyme in, um, in June and uh, have been through and, and been blessed with excellent doctors, just lucky, um, with very Lyme savvy doctors, which aren't always easy to find, I hear. Um, and I've been on a pretty heavy duty um, regiment of antibiotics, different ones, different combinations since July, which have really set my body, body off into this state of inflammation because it's part of the die off. And I guess, and now I'm starting to feel better. Um, and I, I, it occurs to me that I've spent the last six months um, doing the course because I felt so lost and being so sick, and that's a positive to, to be doing the course. But I also feel really like I've so identified with being sick now that I that the the prospect of getting well and getting back into life is really. It's something that I've wanted since June, but it's also something that's really scaring me because I don't really, because the process has changed me and made me deeper and made me more compassionate and put me in this course and in this room and on live stream. But it, and that's good, but it's also, I, I just don't know where, you know, I don't know how well I'm going to be. I don't know if I'm going, this is going to be eradicated permanently or whether I'm going to be living with symptoms. I don't know whether I yeah. want to go back into my field. Right. I, I just feel like... You know, the Course in Miracles talks about the realm of the changeable and the realm of the changeless. So it's like in the New Testament when Jesus said, you can build your house on rock or you can build your house on sand. Build your house on sand, the winds come, the rains come, your house is blown away. You build your house on rock and your house remains firm. How your body is whether you're doing well, whether you're not doing well. Ba you know, we, all of that changeable realm of things produces fear, but it produces fear because it's the realm of the body. The more we identify through doing the course, through whatever your spiritual practice is, with the realm of that does, that does not change, then your inner peace does not rest on the condition of your body. Now, the fact that it's a new situation, that's where all of us are. I think particularly given Americans also aren't as used to things being as unstable as they are even politically in our society today. So there's, there's a lot of nobody, it, it, it's harder. It's like everybody's like a dreidel right now, you know, kind of like wobbly. It's a very wobbly moment. But once again, that's part of the deepening that's why prayer, that's why meditation, that's why doing the course. Nobody knows fully the perfect way to dwell within the day. None of us. Now, yours is dramatic because it's a dramatic circumstance of whether I'm sick or whether I'm not sick. But even though others in this room don't have such dramatic differences, none of us know what today will bring. So all of us are challenged. All of us are challenged to, to find that place, to dwell within that place, which is what, whether it's the course or whatever your practice of prayer and meditation is, gives you, which is that it's not about my circumstances. 
It's about my, it's, it's not about our circumstances in life. It's about who we are while dwelling within our circumstances. Does that make sense? The ego and the thinking of the world is all about, well, what's happening? You know, you sit down with somebody, well, tell me what's happening, because uh, what are we going to say? Well, tell me who you are today. I mean, you know, it would be awkward. But our whole conversation is about what's quote unquote happening when in fact we know that what's happening isn't really about what's happening. What's really happening is who am I within the realm of what's happening? And you know, none of us know, you know, there's that part, you know, that none of us know who's going to be sick tomorrow and who's going to be well. None of us know who's going to die tomorrow and who's going to live. None of us, we, we have, the, we spend so much time trying to control it and make it so it's okay. The truth of the matter is there is a vast unknowing about what comes next. That is simply a part of, of truth, whether we admit it or not. And, and I think that that's, that even, it's kind of like we were talking about death tonight. When you accept that death is going to happen, it makes life richer, and when you've lived enough that either in you or in the lives of those you love, some things have come out of the blue that weren't wonderful, it makes you far more appreciative. And I think that that's really a thing for you, Sarah. Today I don't hurt. And like how amazing that they're able to give you that medicine. And, and if you had lived in, I'm sure you've thought about all this. You know, I, I was on a uh, some medicine recently, and I thought, God, if I lived in certain places in the world, I wouldn't have had this medicine. It's, a blessing. it's such a blessing, and it just makes you grateful. It makes you, anything can deepen you. That's the only, Nietzsche says, um, there's a line that I, I have in, in Tears to Triumph, something about all life is suffering, and our survival is finding meaning in the suffering. What is the meaning of all this? And the meaning of what you're going through is, wow, I can really, what it is to be grateful for the fact that my hand, I never, I always took my fingers for granted. I remember I was with a man who was diagnosed with MS when I was with him, and he, he I, I was with him when he, he said, I, I can't turn, he couldn't turn the handle. It was like his hand was like a bear claw. You know, there are so many things in life that can make you so grateful that you're, you know, I recently broke my toe. You don't, you don't think about how grateful you are that your foot works, you know? Anyway, you get my point. Okay. Okay, Michael. Oh, thank you. And then I'm going to go up and do those. <clears throat> yes, honey? Uh, something about um, death. Death. And um, um, I don't remember being held. I don't remember anybody saying, I love you. My dad was a workaholic. I just never saw him. Uh, my mom didn't say, read a book, how school. My dad died when I was 19. I cried when I was 29. Um, Until you were 29? When I was 29, okay. I finally cried. Did some Reiki and stuff and okay. out it came. And um, but what you said about that, uh, the relationship continues. Yeah. I saw a film last year called Lion. I don't know if you saw it. Lion? Lion. Like, no. like a lion in the forest. Oh, uh, lion. Okay. Yeah. And that put me in touch with my relationship with my mother, even though I, I complained about her so much in therapy and... And then, and my dad, until the nonviolent violent community. Oh, you okay, honey? <laughs> until the, started working with the nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. I, that, that created okay. the forgiveness. But uh, the relationship continuing, and I just wanted to share this film Lion. Lion. And, and I dedicated my book to my parents, well, which I never thought I would do. Yeah. Because what I wrote in it is they were doing the best they could with what they learned right. from grandma and grandpa. So this relationship is continuing. And I saw this picture of my dad from the 50s. He, he's sitting in a chair with a cigarette between his fingers. Kind of looks like Tyrone Power. Uh -huh. And I started looking at it. And 
he looks a bit like a Zen master. <laughs> that only took 40 years to be in touch with that. So this continuing relationship, grateful to hear about that tonight. The more, the, you know, it's not like you get to some age where you've gotten all the insights. And sometimes the older you get, the deeper your insights about your childhood. I see that. I see the older I get, the more I understand it. And you know, you kind of like, well, I wish I'd gotten, I wish I'd had that 30 years ago. <laughs> but I think that we, once again, even that, the more you realize this continues even after physical, uh, after, and, and also the more we have an opening to the fact that age, a lot's going on. You know, the, the body, you know, diminished physical resources don't mean diminished spiritual resources. That, you know, it's all about learning to dwell in the mystery, that there's so much more going on here than we think. Okay, I want to do a couple of these before we, before we close for the evening. <clears throat> okay, let me see. I am married, have a very loving and caring husband who I deeply love. Some years ago, when I was already married, I became friends with a man who with time became my best friend. We're both AC, uh, Course in Miracles students and have a lot in common. I wasn't worried about us being close friends and neither did my husband because my friend was much older than I am. Nonetheless, after five years of being best friends, we ended up having an affair which lasted for two months. I thought I was going to leave my husband to be with this man, but I didn't. I do feel that I love them both, and they are both the love of my life. Yet I am with my husband, and it feels right. After the affair, my friend and I tried to remain friends, but it gets complicated because there are a lot of feelings that we both experience. <coughs> We see each other very often because we work in the same field. And every time I see him, emotions come up and I don't know what to do. We tried not to talk and not to see each other, but every time we end up not following through. When I don't see him, I miss my best friend. And when I see him, I experience emotions which are difficult to deal with. It's been a year since the affair was over, yet I still struggle and st am still confused. I will greatly appreciate your feedback. Okay. A year. Um, you say we tried not to talk. I mean, there is a reason why, one, you know, once you get sexual with someone, and there are so many different um, etheric and chemical realms that have joined, we are way too casual in our society, we, we, it's, it's a lack of, uh, it's the true meaning of self-care. If you had an affair with this man, and you're not gonna be with this man, and, and you're married, a year not seeing each other, at least a year not seeing each other makes sense. I know mistakes I've made in my life is when I thought, oh, you know, we can see each other now. No, we can't. Right, it, and, it, and, and, and you think that you're more ready and you think you're more prepared. There's a lack of, if anything, you know, there's, we're not careful enough in our society about sex and we're not careful enough about, uh, you know, you gotta be real careful. If you've had an affair with this man and then you decided you're not gonna be with him, then a reasonable assumption would be that it would be at least a year of not seeing each other before you are chemically prepared to have any kind of behavioral calm. Does that make sense? That seems to be, I know I learned that one the hard way. No, you know, you think, oh, I'm cool. <laughs> no, I'm so not cool. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <coughs> I've struggled as a gay man for quite some time. 
I'm 35 and have no gay friends. Additionally, I've been single for 12 or 13 years, if not more. It's been extremely lonely and depressing. I've met and talked to so many guys on dating apps, but I've been very hard pressed to find anyone who is interested in spirituality or who believes in God. The only God the gay community seems to believe in is the worship of their own self and the worship of sex and money. It's the all about me cancer that you talk so truthfully about is alive and well in the gay community, especially. So I just have to say uh, that that is, I, I, I really want to say, I hope this person is, 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 that is so not my experience. Gay community gave me my career because of Course in Miracles lectures during the AIDS crisis. Um, that is not, I mean, some of the deepest seekers that I know are gay men and, 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 and gay women. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that that is your experience, but I hope that you're willing to change that thought. Throughout the past few years, I have fallen in unrequited love with multiple men. During these encounters, I would be extremely loving at times, but then also fall into my wounds at other times and act from my wounds. Yeah, you and the rest of us. As you say, <clears throat> as you say, relationships, I mean, who among us doesn't act from our wounds sometimes, right? Relationships are laboratories of the spirit and hospitals of the soul. During my depressive episodes, I would lash out at these men, say things I don't mean. To these men, it must have seemed I was bipolar. They couldn't and didn't want to handle that. Each of them eventually stopped talking to me, blocked me from contacting them further. While disappointing, it is understandable that is choice. Okay. What I'm struggling with, he says, from A Course in Miracles perspective is this. I still wish I had the ability to reconcile with these individuals and to heal. Not from a romantic perspective, but I just wish we could still be friends and cordial at a minimum. I pray for each of these men daily and often multiple times per day. I know you say to pray for someone for 30 days and either their behavior will change or I won't care anymore. I've been praying for these individuals for months and I still care. How can I let go of the desire to have them in my life? I really want to stop thinking about them so much so I could move on. Um, I want to say something about how motivating it is to change when you have found consequences of your wrong-minded behavior in the form of someone who just doesn't want to hear it anymore. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes you said the wrong thing, you did the wrong thing, you lashed out, something like that, and they don't want to talk to you. And there's no point emailing, they don't want to hear, they don't want to hear from you, there's no point calling, they don't want to talk to you. And you have to endure that. And that's, I think those are the kinds of experiences that brought a lot of us here. Those are the kinds of experiences that brought a lot of us to the Course in Miracles. You, is having blown it in life. You know, I <clears throat> have a story in Return to Love where I talk about how every time something like this gentleman just mentioned would happen, I would pray for a miracle and I'd pray for correction. And then I'd get my miracle and then I'd do it again because like you were saying, Natalie, I wasn't yet realizing this has to be consistent practice. And I would do the same thing again. I'd make the same mistake again. And finally, after making these mistakes, praying for a miracle, getting a miracle, doing the mistake again, finally one day I said to myself, next time you're down on your knees, why don't you just stay there? <laughs> so, Anthony, you're going through what we all go through which is the horror and the humiliation of knowing how crazy we can get and how we can really blow it with people when we're not in our right mind. And most of us have been there. And sometimes, no, they don't want to talk to you about it. And they, don't, they, they might not ever. You have no guarantee that they will. But as you atone for your mistake and forgive other people for theirs and move on with your life, you know what it does, guys? It just makes us more humble. And there's no guarantee that those people are going to want to talk to you again. So next time you go out there, you might not act so crazy next time. And that's really the truth. You know, sometimes in the spiritual community, we sugarcoat stuff. And it doesn't serve. 
It doesn't serve. When you're not in your love mind, you're in your insane mind. So let's pray for Anthony, but also, Anthony, I hope that you'll give up on that idea that gay culture is all, I mean, there, there is within every, you know, every culture has its bright side and its shadow side, because every person does. So if you, if you want to point out a superficial aspect of a particular community, I'm sure you can find it, but if you want to find the deep seekers within the community, you can find that as well, Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it for tonight. Anybody else have anything? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. One more. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'll make this really quick. <laughs> um, I was reading your book, um, Tears of Triumph, and the story of Moses uh, spoke out to me um, in particular. I'm yeah, it does. And um, I had a quick question. Um, the story stopped, you know, like they finally reached the land of honey. But um, there was a moment where, you know, of course, Moses goes to the mountaintop to get the Ten Commandments. And then he comes back and, you know, he sees the situation of the people. I was wondering if you could quickly explain the me metaphysics behind that. And um, that was when, when he comes back with the Ten Commandments, or when he comes back and God says to the to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, "I will make of you a priestly people." Yeah, but there is also when he was like when the people were like worshiping the cow or something like that, or there is like I was curious. The, the golden cow. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I do not talk about that. But the golden calf, because yeah, that's not in that was, particular yeah, story. Yeah, that wasn't in the book. I was like, I was always curious about like what, okay. what you thought well, about that. Okay. Well, all I talked about for the story of Moses and the story of Exodus in that particular book had specifically to do uh, with 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 how it relates to human despair and depression. But there are some marvelous books out there about the metaphysics of the story of the Exodus. And I highly recommend them. There is one, and I, I can't remember the name. Of, it's a rabbi out of uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. But there's some wonderful books about the, the, all, all the Bible stories. The metaphysics of the Bible stories, whether it's the New Testament, the Old Testament, any book that has to do with the deep psychological and spiritual interpretations. But the story of Exodus is, is deeply, deeply redolent with meaning. Go to any, go on, you know, Go into Google it, go into a library, go into a bookstore, and you're going to see many, uh, many books that go into deep detail about the deeper psychological significance of the story of the Exodus. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay? All right. Let us pray. Hold on just a moment. <clears throat> okay. We're going to begin with a prayer Natalie was talking about how she felt that coming here that God was telling her I'm preparing you and it reminds me of something that Sarah had said also it's very painful sometimes to be in that in-between place you know that you're better than you used to be but you haven't quite gotten it all together in a particular area that makes sense and I think because so much is changing right now in our culture and in our world, I don't know anybody who feels super solid ground. But even knowing that, it's okay. Because dwelling in the not knowing, dwelling in the mystery, dwelling in the fact that, that God is working on us, I think the point for us as spiritual seekers together is just don't do anything stupid in the meantime. And I mean that so seriously. Uh, social media, the fact we can text, we, we are given way too much opportunity to blow it these days. It's too easy to communicate. It's too easy, you know, everybody lacks impulse control right now because there's so much anxiety in the middle of things. But this is, and I, I know for myself, those are when I've made my mistakes. I just wasn't, it, I was moving too fast. And you can say something or do something that you regret for months or years. So slowing down, cultivating a more reflective lifestyle is so important, especially during this time when we're all changing so deeply within. Let's pray. Dear God, we join with Natalie as she prays that the alchemy of the Holy Spirit within her transform her 
and that she feel your presence as she moves through these changes. May all of us feel your presence as we move through these changes. May all of us feel the comfort of your angels and of your hand. We pray for Charlotte Patton. Dear God, may her entrance into heavenly realms be deeply peaceful. And may she feel the love of those of us who knew her here and love her still. We pray for Roxy, for Lindsay, for Susanna, and for Debbie, for Anthony, for Barbara, for Mary Ann, for Shelley, for David, for Anne, for Jean, for Natalie, for Prince, for Mila, and for Zaki, for Martha, for Rockney, Andrea, Rochelle, Elaine, Tiffany, Ingrid, Luis, and Maria. All of us place our burdens and our questions in God's hands. And where we need a miracle, we pray for one. And now go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. God's path of light is already paved before you. Seek to take each step in the light of compassion and understanding and acceptance and love. And if any moment you're in doubt or in fear or confusion, put your hand in front of you as would a small child seeking the hand of an elder brother. The elder brother shall take your hand, lead you back to the path, and should you request it, remain with you there. This is no idle fantasy. He is here, blessing all the world, giving thanks for all the world. And so it is, together we say, amen. Thank you so much, everybody. God willing, see you next week. <laughs>